We'll start with introductions. My name is Corinne Mason. This is Jordan. I'm Jordan. Forever. Um, so we're really excited to be here today and have really enjoyed the chats that we've had so far. Um, Corinne and I are, well, I'll tell I guess I'll tell you just a bit about myself and then about sort of us as plan and starting that off. But um, I'm a grad student at Carleton University in sociology and really interested in um, feminist media, feminist media activism, representations of gender and violence, and in particular violence against women in all, all forms of media. Um, and so through that, have started working with the Ottawa Coalition to End Violence Against Women, uh, which is how I met Corinne, and have also been, become very interested in an organization called Women in Action in the Media, which we are, wham, it's how we're <laughs> referring to that. Um, and so we you want to talk a bit about yourself? Sure. Yeah. Um, I am a PhD student at the University of Ottawa. Um, so I study in the Women's Studies Department. And part of my research looks at um, gender justice in the media. Um, so my interest in violence against women brought me to thinking about um, the ways in which stories of violence against women um, are being produced in the local media in particular. Um, so moving to Ottawa, uh, reading the Ottawa Citizen, keeping up to date with the CBC, I found a lot of problematic narratives um, about cases of violence against women. And the first case that I um, started to think about and started to write about was the Shafia trial. Um, so the Shafia murder in 2009 in which three um, young girls and um, their, the, second, uh, the second wife of their father were killed in Kingston, Ontario. At that time, I was living in Kingston and working at the Kingston Interval House. Um, and this was a big issue for our feminist organization, working at a uh, women's abuse shelter, and became um, something I was really interested in, in terms of the way in which it was being represented in the media. So um, coming to the Ottawa Coalition Against uh, Violence Against Women, I was interested in kind of doing some media activism. Um, when I met Jordan, we realized we both had an interest in doing some uh, gender justice in the media activism, and Jordan invited me into starting up a WAM Ottawa chapter. Um, so maybe I'll let Jordan speak a little bit about WAM, and we can talk about the ways that we think our organization um, We'll do some kind of activism around gender in the media and maybe talk about some examples of the ways that we see kind of problematic portrayals um, in the media and the ways that we think uh, women are doing some pretty badass activism with media, in particular social media, um, which is the exciting part. <laughs> so, should I sit too? Yeah, I'm <laughs> just much more, yeah. much less fidgety. <laughs> yeah, um, I feel lots of given Greg's questions kind of that we're going to talk, maybe we'll just kind of talk since we already started doing that too, unless, and then whenever you have questions just jump in, um, and that works too, but so Women Action in the Media is, uh, it was started in 2004 in New York City, and so there's now chapters in uh, Los Angeles, uh, San Francisco Bay Area, Boston, Chicago, and Vancouver, so Ottawa would be the second chapter and all of these chapters of WAM are connected by a vision of um, gender equity in media so just really advancing like um, in terms of representation employment and ownership um, the things that Simi was talking about in terms of like people in positions of power um, and also in representation like just ad advancing gender equity but really as I know Corinne will talk about uh, and Simi did too, like the intersection and, and interconnectedness of so many justice issues in media, gender, race, sexuality, things, it's sort of all tied in. So um, the name of Women Action Media is a, a little bit misleading in that sense because there is this really sort of a broad justice vision, but specifically tied in to gender and what we're talking about today. Um, so. What WEM does is really broad, and there's a, it's really recognizing that you know, gender justice in the media can mean 
so many different things and can happen in so many different ways. But um, I guess, you know, I might take a minute to ask just, we probably won't write it down as we go, but when I say gender justice in the media or when you think about media and issues around gender, is there anything that comes to mind for you? Like for me, I think about it as when I read about gender, what kind of sparks, you know, makes me mad or makes me upset or makes me like, why are, why is it being portrayed that way? Are there any themes or ideas that jump out for you? There's, um, I, I read an article, I don't remember when it was, a little while ago, and it, it, I'm not sure if it was about, um, uh, I think it was about a transgendered woman who was working in a Kingston prison. Mm -hmm. And so some of you may be familiar with that article, and I just, I found it really interesting to see how whoever wrote that article was always referring to her by the correct pronoun, and so I thought that was a good example. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's, no, that's awesome. And, and a positive gender example. Yeah. <laughs> that rarely happens now. <laughs> and, and I think what, like, the idea behind WAM is to create a space that, like, connects people that are interested in talking about these themes, and whether it's people that are journalists or writers or bloggers or interested community members, activists, academics, like, policymakers, anyone, and connecting, giving a space, and really supporting. So it might be some of the things. We had our first meeting of WAM last week, and we're very happy to have a we're small quarter of people. Yeah, we're very new. It's very grassroots, and it's going to be really just whatever people from the Ottawa area are there and interested in doing different media work. So we've talked about training and mentoring in workshops, um, something like what's happening today in terms of these kind of conversations. Corinne has a friend that writes great op-ed pieces for the newspapers and on different gender issues, feminist issues, uh, maybe doing a training around that. Um, I think for anyone that spends time working in different media spaces or public spaces, there it's not always a safe space, right? Like it's really pleasant to be in this room and with you know, all, of, all of us here and talking about these things. I don't feel the same way in terms of like some things that I can write online or in different, you know, maybe I'm sure perhaps some uh, journalists working for different media organizations in Ottawa may not always <coughs> feel um, a huge amount of support in terms of in terms of different areas as well. So it's providing a space for people to come together and kind of really network and say, you know, there's this great media co-op workshop that's going on. Um, there's you know very cool like multiculturalism and media critical analysis going on. Let's promote that. So that's really the, the vision behind WAM. Right now, we are um, a Facebook page and a, the start of a blog and a Twitter account. Mm -hmm. And uh, that's where we're going from um, in there. And we hope to just really like foster some, some more work and build on work of different organizations that are already happening in Ottawa. And I think we've been pleasantly surprised in the last few weeks to just really find out more. Like for me, a lot of it's also personal interest. I, I find being a university student that sometimes these conversations always take place in the university setting. And it's you know, a bunch of grad students talking to each other and profs. And that can be exciting maybe in its own way, but isn't, I don't know. I, I, don't, I don't feel that's the end of what should happen. You know, I think there should be a lot more stuff going on in it. Yeah, just like having these conversations is where, where some really great gender justice stuff takes place. And I think I would add, how many minutes? Six minutes. Um, <laughs> I, know that I think part of what brought me to WIM was that um, a lot of my work in the media has been responses. So it's about seeing something in the media that I have said, this is problematically represented, I don't agree, I think it's a distorted conversation like we were talking about before. Um, how do I get my message out there? So I started 
writing letters to the editors, which were not well received, <laughs> reading comments after you've posted a letter to the editor is really disheartening, and also kind of exciting. Like, you're like, oh yeah, you think I'm terrible? I've got a lot more to say. That's not even my best. Um, and trying to write off ads and trying to get space in kind of the mainstream media. And I think if anybody has written letters to the editor or have tried to do um, some of that work with mainstream and like really corporatized media, you'll see the door is closed pretty fast or it's hard to get in, it's hard to make the right connections, it's difficult to say the right things. Um, or in the case of writing opinion editorials, having an editor say what you can and cannot say and want to shape your story and not feeling like you've got the freedom to really respond in the ways that you want to. So I think part of women action media is taking that action and taking that power back and finding ways in which women and other marginalized communities um, can take the reins of knowledge production so that the mainstream media isn't the only site in which knowledge is produced. Like We have our own. We can speak from experience. Um, we can speak with voices that are often not heard in the mainstream media, and we can do it in alternative sites for our communities. Um, so I think that's one of the exciting things um, about doing kind of media uh, activist work. Um, and hopefully we'll be able to get some of that off the ground with WAM having um, having a blog site and having people um, post on our blog and do kind of guest posts, whether it's personal stuff, um, organizational stuff, um, things that they're seeing in the media or maybe not seeing in the media that they think is important, and creating kind of like a hub for a different type of, of knowledge production site, which I think is part of the really cool stuff. So not only responding to the things that we see um, that we don't like, <laughs> but also creating different stories and our own stories. And I think I think part of it too is that there's sometimes this idea that like, well nobody you don't need to work towards gender justice or, you know, women advancements or anything like feminism's dead, that's men and women are equal and things like that. And but for anyone that like first of all <laughs> well there's so many things to say about that. Um, but I think that when we look at, at social media and a lot of different things happening online, like there's a lot of space in there for doing really progressive, interesting things. But I don't know if anyone's ever seen like a, a Facebook page that's um, you know, promoting violence against women or things like that that are, are still taking place there. So I think the idea behind WAM is that even though there's all these great opportunities with like Facebook and Twitter and online journalism and citizen media and all that kind of stuff, that unless that there is groups and people that are writing in those spaces and challenging a lot of like dominant ideas, um, whitewashing you know, they, and all these ideas, then the same kind of power structures are just going to translate over. The same problems that we see with a lot of like big mass media will still take place in different in different ways unless there's other voices there speaking up. Um, I don't know, does that, are there, does that make sense? Are there kind of questions or things about, yeah? Uh, just wondering, I guess I could, it's for all three of you. Um, has, I haven't heard much about uh, affirmative action programs these days in the last five or even 10 years. I don't know, is that is that kind of gone from the public arena as, as a, something that still happens? I think they've just reworded it as equal employment opportunity. <laughs> so they are still okay. they're still there. There's definitely still organizations that have uh, that have like diverse same like ones. the same idea where you're supposed to have a proportion of your workforce that is representative of the diversity around us. I think um, the term affirmative action is more a US based term than it is a Canadian one. So I think we recognize it because so much of our influences are US based, but it might not be as recognizable because our terminology is different in Canada under a multicultural versus like melting pot policy. So it's work is it working then? 
a good question. <laughs> Probably <laughs> not given the stats yeah, on yeah, this, yeah. like on the mainstream yeah. media. Well, there's there's a there's a disconnect somewhere, and I don't yes. know where it is. Um, but I will I will say that um, the research that I've done shows that people uh, people of color who are are actually like getting paid less to do the same work as um, dominant white individuals, and interestingly enough, not to pull those recession. Um, apparently, the more ethnic sounding your name is, the less likely you are to get hired for a job or interviewed or selected in your sense. That's not just the media. That's, that's our, and that's mm -hmm. everywhere. Yeah. That's just they, that's they just do studies of like temper agencies. This is the United States, but the company will say we want I can't remember the term was like all American or something. Which really means blonde hair and blue eyed receptionist, right? Mm -hmm. But if you're like black, forget it. So you, you know what I mean? It just it's definitely you have time, you have the opportunity to show up. But then there have been maybe since then like like that affirmative action stuff. And I know a guy. Well, I know a guy who's native Canadian, and now he hosts like the four to six show on CBC in Edmonton. And he started out as at CBC on an affirmative action, like to bring the natives into the media program, and he got some experience, and then went to KCU, and then he did a bunch of other stuff, and now he's, oh, then he went to APTN, and now he's hosting the four to six show, you know, that's a totally mainstream, cover everything, magazine style show. But maybe you're right, man, maybe like, producers don't let him really do what he wants to do, I don't know. Or I it's just that. too too few and far between that we yeah. see yeah. people make it right as a token. Oh, yeah, yeah, it's a token. And yeah. also to have I don't think you know, have people celebrating like the work that someone's done to get in these positions and not have it be said like, well, that's the token person or they're there because of this. But to really, you know, and I think for at least speaking for women actually in the media, like questioning some areas that don't always get questioned. Corinne and I were talking about. The, you know the show The Bachelor and The Bachelorette, those mm -hmm. like reality television shows, right? yeah. but like mm -hmm. they, to my knowledge, we're talking about they're, they're always white, white people, white individuals, right? And so white, able body, white, yeah, hetero, and, yeah, and so just really like having some conversations about um, representations of gender and and men and women and masculinities and femininities and how, um, for Ottawa as well, like what, what really local issues are there and, and local interests and strengths to build on as well. Um, I don't know how we're doing for time, but I think that's it. I think we're it's over. over. <laughs> 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 okay, can I ask a question? I was just wondering if you guys could say a little bit about masculinities and femininity. Yeah. Um, okay, so I guess using the term masculinities and femininities, we use it as plural. Um, because an understanding of gender, just like race, we're thinking about social construction. So um, ideas that become dominant because they become kind of like common sense understandings of difference. So the ways in which men and women, in terms of uh, a sex body or what we understand to be a sex body, get mapped on um, certain ways of being. So um, things that are feminine, you can go as basic as pink, um, as basic as um, gendered clothing, dresses versus pants, um, masculine um, presentation. So I sit with my legs crossed, it's a very feminine way to sit. If I want to take up a lot of masculine space, I would sit as wide as possible, especially on the OC Transpo bus when there's no <laughs> other seats to be had, right? So it's about certain ways that we control our bodies and our beings and the ways that we live um, as ascribing to or as um, shaking off um, the ways in which that we're supposed to be masculine and feminine. And we speak about femininities and masculinities um, because we want to think about the ways in which uh, female bodies can take up masculine traits. So uh, for trans people, for gender queer people, for people that don't ascribe to gendered norms of femininity and masculinity, we want to kind of 
take take the sex body and um, think about how we all kind of perform masculinities and femininities in different ways. Does that make sense? That was really convoluted. Yeah. Yeah, there's there's a makeup is a big one. Makeup's a huge yeah. one. Yeah. Uh, shaving your legs as big opposed time. to like I wear a lot of flannel shirt, right. you know, and no makeup and so right. that categorize me right. in the eyes of other people. Right. If you ever want to play like kind of fun game when you're watching commercials and for any of you that watch T V and you know commercials you can flip the, the kind of gender norm that like when I see cleaning product commercials like it's always the woman that's ecstatic that she can now scrub her shower easier mm -hmm. and she's so happy and you think we about really like yogurt yeah people with vaginas women women love like yogurt <laughs> it's like we love the be all end all yeah. yogurt I'm I've never been happier with yogurt in my life yeah, yeah. And or you know beer Dying commercials, women, and so you kind of start to think about like what sort of challenge does that present mm -hmm. to gender norms? Mm -hmm. If you know it's a man putting on lipstick and it's so ecstatic because so. it stays on all day long. Once you, you know? flip that on its head, it becomes unnatural, yeah. right? Mm -hmm. Like we recognize how unnatural it is if you if you flip the script. Yeah. So if you have a man doing these feminized tasks, then we were like, oh, it's weird. And why is it weird? Because women are supposed to act in a, a certain way and we normalize that and we naturalize that and we think it's just like you know right out the canal into the pink onesie well no we like we construct that right yeah yeah and kids as young as five years old already know what you're supposed or not supposed to do on the basis of gender yeah and it's constantly we socialization yeah. we fit that into them because culturally we still come in that luggage I because like I can that. even speak for myself. I got four boys, and when my grandmother came and lived with me, it's at times that I got to pray before I even look at her because I wanted to do everything different from the way that I was brought up. Because my mother was in law, so my mother believed that a man is the center of your life, and the whole goes with it, even with food girls who are not allowed to eat the same type of food with boys, blah, blah, blah. So I wanted to change that, and luckily enough that God gave me my first son as a, a, a boy. That alone, because to her, she took issue. She was very upset on a daily basis, because I put a little step, and my son would get on the step and wash dishes. He's a man, he's not supposed to wash dishes. Watching me cooking. No, he's supposed to read in the living room. So culture got a lot to do with it. So I think that's where the confusion is. I'll still go on even today. We separate the gender right from birth. Yes, yeah, the color color. right from birth. Yeah. Oh. And, and we see all those things in the thing. media yes. being shown back to us, oh, right? Definitely. So it's a consistent definitely. process of socialization. Yeah. Yeah, they did experiment where they would dress the girl, a little baby girl, like a boy, and a boy, but differently. And people would react differently to mm -hmm. these kids. It's yeah. interesting On experiment. what they thought they were yes. in terms of gender. It's a very interesting experiment to um, just to try out, um, to meet a baby for the first time, and try and not ask gendered questions. Mm -hmm. Because as soon as you have a child, mm -hmm. or as soon as like someone's pregnant, and you say, boy or girl, like yes. I always think it would be great to ever be pregnant and say like, who knows, I guess we'll choose that when they come out and they decide, right? right? So but right yeah. now they're just my baby, like there's this little person who yeah. could be a variety of things. Mm -hmm. um, but it, it's interesting to try and think about <laughs> how we how we play gender games oh, yes. all the time. And we, Unconsciously. Yeah, but it's really hard to work yourself out of it because yeah. we do it so naturally it's because we've been taught to. It's a challenge. Okay. Yeah, so we're done. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs>